Hey, Broadway people. Thanks for coming back to another week with Broadway Breakdown here on Popcorn Talk Network. This week we're talking Les Miserables, the theater show. So stay tuned. You don't want to miss a second of it. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, more. news, and interviews. Another Popcorn day, Talk. We talk movies. Oh, uh, yes. Are we live now? We are live now. <laughs> You're one Sorry. Day I, I'm mesmerized by Colm's voice. It's just, it I always know. happens to me. It, it takes a second, and then you have to, like, after the astonishment of how amazing he is, then you He's can He's my talk. favorite Jean Valjean. <laughs> Not, I mean, there there are plenty of Jean Valjeans with beautiful voices, but Colm is by far my favorite. It's just, he has a very distinctive voice, and it's he like, does. when he, you... It's a very certain way of singing that yeah. like, not many people do well and it's like uh, he just i mean he's irish but it's not like you can actually hear his accent when he sings i don't i'm not sure what it is about his voice but there's something it's about unique. it that is very unique. unique hey guys welcome back with us this week we're like i said talking to them as i'm channeling a little bit of my eponine here <laughs> it's called modern day eponine i'm i decided what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna dress a little bit like characters each week but it's not going to be fully. Like, sometimes it'll be fully if I have an actual costume for it. But if not, it's going to be, like, I'm going to call it Broadway bounding, like Disney bounding. Oh, I like that. So I we're like going to bob it. Broadway yeah. bound here. Hey, guys. I'm Brianna Phipps. I'll be your host tonight. You can reach me at bphipps14 Instagram and Twitter, bphipps1214 on Snapchat. Jackie, where can they find you? I'm 123JackieB on all platforms except Snapchat. It's JackieB123. And I'm sporting my 24601 shirt because... Um, <laughs> so we got Valjean and Eponine. Yeah, Valjean and Eponine. <laughs> Valjean, the original superhero. It's true. Read the book. And like I said, guys, we're discussing Les Mis today, which, if you are not aware, is a show that is about, uh, it's based on a book by Victor Hugo, and it's about a um, convict who is basically just always escaping this one officer of the law. But before we get into that, we're going to talk a little bit about our news, which is always brought to us by BroadwayWorld.com and Robert Diamond. And we actually have Robert Diamond here with us today via Skype. Hey, Robert, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you guys? We're great. We're great. Good to see you. Although I think you can't really see us, but that's no, neither. Imagination that's here. neither here nor there. You can watch us later to see what we look like. Thank you so I much for joining. Up and had a flag or something. Had I known we were doing that. Oh yeah, it was. It's just something that I decided to do, like spur of the moment. So don't don't feel. I too wear bad this here. shirt every day of my life. So not every day of my life. That's a slight exaggeration. Just slight. I wear this shirt so often that. Um, this really doesn't feel out of the ordinary to be wearing it. It just so happens that here I am and here the shirt is. My shirt says 24601, by the way. Got it. It's the men's shirt from uh, the Les Mis tour that we had in L.A. a couple years ago. And I got so mad because I was like, why don't you have this shirt in women's sizes? Because the largest was a man's small, which was way too big for me. And they were like, oh, women don't really like that shirt. And I was like... Screw you! I don't want a pink Cosette shirt. I don't. <laughs> um, so I just wash the shirt a lot to shrink it to my size. So That's what I you gotta can, do sometimes. So I can support my Jean Valjean. Um, thank you so much for coming on with us, Robert. We really appreciate all the news you give us every week. And I just wanted to go over that a little bit um, and see what your thoughts on it were, too, being the person that's in charge of all of this. So w we have gotten our first look into the Wicked movie via Comic-Con. I'm not sure that's really a look more it's than just, a look. Okay, it was a just saying we're writing new songs so we can win an Oscar. Okay, we get you. It was still exciting. Gosh. It's writing four new songs, so it's actually even more exciting than just sticking one song in as Oscar bait. Yeah, and one of the songs was originally... I feel like that just means it's super Oscar baity. But one of the songs was originally gonna be in the show, and they cut it from the show. Okay, I can support that. I can support that. But I, I do, I mean, this is classic. To me, this is just even more Oscar Beatty than usual. I mean. Whatever, Jackie. It depends, it over depends there. on what the song is. But so far, every song that I've heard that's been written for Oscar bait, to me, has not been very good. It, it just doesn't compare to the original musical numbers. So, I don't know. Well, I'm just going to just gonna leave you over there in your negative world. Yeah, well, maybe they'll strike out with the, the song that sit. was originally supposed to be in the original production. Maybe. I mean. Um, the one thing that I was a little upset about was that I really wanted to hear 
some casting, like her like thoughts yeah. about casting. Yeah, that's a bummer too. Uh, that's why it's not real news. It's I, news. I, it's not till December of 2019. And they say casting's not going to start till at least next year. And if you think, you know, if they're actually going to be age appropriate, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. we might not even know who they are yet. So they're, why you got to be sensible like that? Why you got to be sensible? <laughs> <laughs> if you could cast someone, Robert, what do you, who do you think would be good in that movie? Like, right, as of right now? Like, do you think uh, of anyone off the top of your head that you'd like to see play? I mean, I, I would love to see an animated version that featured the original cast. Yes! Nobody asked me for my opinion. <laughs> I did! I like that! I vote that! I, I vote just that. want somebody that can do justice to the, the wonderful score. I vote that. Yeah, that I would vote be, that. That would be good. I like that idea. Um... I know there has been the rumors of Leah Michelle, uh, which I that I feel like they always want to put her in a Dina Menzel yeah, role. Yeah, like she has she has a great voice, and yes, there are certain similarities like that you can't deny between her and a Dina Menzel. But I just feel like that's like almost cliche at this point to cast her in that role. But you and know. I think Harry Styles was the other one they were, which I'm not completely on board I, with. No, not that he doesn't have a good voice either, but I don't know. A, a lot of a lot of what happens to me, and maybe you can weigh in on this, um, a lot of what I see is people think, okay, if we cast some really big names, like a Harry Styles, a, like a very well-known pop singer kind of dude, then we'll bring in the audience. But it's like, then you start to alienate the actual fans of the production because they don't see how like Harry Styles fits into this, which is a problem I've had with a couple musicals um, where I've been like, I'm not really sure how this person fits into this Nick Jonas in the 25th anniversary of Les Mis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there have been many bad musical movies that have cast uh, actors or stars versus singers. Um, so the, the hope is you get somebody that can do it justice. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they joke about that in a uh, play called Title of Show, where they have this whole thing being like, people want to see Paris Hilton in the apple tree, and he's like, who wants to see Paris Hilton in the apple tree? I don't know, a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah. It sells tickets, because it brings people that maybe normally didn't want to see a show to see it, because I get to see Paris Hilton in the apple I don't know. Who do you think was good casting in a movie? Let me ask you that. Who do you think was good casting in a, in a Broadway made to You mean like from a... Uh, a standpoint of like a Hollywood casting in a Broadway show? Yes. Okay. Because I, I do on the top of my head know some people that I think that was some really good like like baiting the audience casting but they did a great job. I have people that I think of of that. Like the Chicago movie sort of nailed it. Boom! And- That's exactly what I was thinking of. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah, Chicago. I think any time that you actually look for people that while they're Hollywood they can also sing and maybe come from a theater background, even if it wasn't Broadway. I think that is well. Catherine Zeta Jones, yeah, came from a, a theater background. So I mean, it, even though she became a huge blockbuster movie actress, I, I mean, she came from a theater background. So I thought that worked really well. Well, our other bit of news here we have is Motown is going to conclude its Broadway run early. It's going to do it July thirty first now. Then is it doing a tour, or it's it, just It's done? coming back from a national tour, actually. Oh, it's it was, coming back from a it tour. Was, uh, it left Broadway, I believe, in January. Correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, but January of 2015? Is that when it left Broadway? And then it went on yes. a national tour, and they wanted to circle back, coming back to New York. So now they're yes, ending. Yes, so it was originally an open-ended comeback run, and then it was a limited comeback run, and now it's a very, very limited comeback run. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, you got a week. If you're in New York, you got a week left to catch see it. Catch it, catch it. Yes, but it's a, it's a great cast that did the tour for almost two years, so I mean, at least they get an opportunity to do it in New York to get their New York friends and family to see them. Uh, so that's sort of the bright side to it, is they have a few weeks at least. And, you know, the music, even if you're not into musicals or Broadway music, the music is classic music. Like, you're, you're going to know the songs. So even if you don't think you would like a musical right off the bat, this is not your, this is Motown. You know, this is this kind of music that you grew, at least I grew up with, with my parents listening to. So just go see it. Just give it a chance. Even if you're not into musicals, if you like Motown, go see that show. You got a week. It's, at, <laughs> it's at the Nederlander Theater. So go buy your tickets now for the next week of the show and let us know what you think of it. Um, and then tell everybody you heard about the show <laughs> on Popcorn Talk and Broadway Breakdown. And BroadwayWorld.com. And BroadwayWorld.com. There you go. There um, you go. And that does it for our new state. We wanted to keep it short because we wanted to, we have so, so much to talk about with this show. And Robert, um, 
I know I gave you a list of the shows, and this is kind of one you wanted to come on for. What what, what about Les Mis is, like, why did you want to come on for this show? For It's one of the first musicals that I ever saw on Broadway. It's been a favorite show to revisit many incarnations over the years, from anniversary concerts to films to the Hollywood Bowl. It's just a, it's a near-perfect musical with uh, well, unbelievable and, songs. In your background, I saw that you were a huge, huge... Um, Andrew Lloyd Webber is it Andrew Lloyd Webber fan, or which is that what yes, you're a fan of? Yes, the description of my story. I made uh, Michael Crawford's official website. Michael Crawford, uh, that's was it. Phantom. Uh, who was never in Les Mis, but he, he sings a wonderful bring of home in, in concert sometimes. Oh, I had this like connection in my head of because um, Michael Crawford and the night was Phantom, and then it was Webber. And when Les Mis was first on Broadway, it was amongst like a slew of Webber musicals, and that was my <laughs> connection right there. And it still is. Yeah. Still, still going strong there, Weber and and Les Mis, which and Les comes Mis. back every uh, twenty minutes or so. I I think for Les Mis, for me, like I I too love Les Mis, and I think you're going to be hard pressed in this world to find people who don't just love Les Mis. It's been translated into so many languages. It has cast all over the world. Um, it, it's one of the longest. Uh, it's the second longest running show on Broadway. It's the, the fifth lo- longest uh, on Broadway. Second, second in longest the world. musical running on Broadway. Musical. Not show as far as like plays without music, but it's the second longest actual musical. And then on in uh, the West End, it's the longest actual running musical. Um, so, it, well, regardless of what place it is, it's one of the longest running musicals of all time. Um, and I think, I think that's because the themes are universal. Um, I've read the the Victor Hugo novel as long as it is. I read it in English, not in its original French, which is like one of my goals. Um, unabridged. Uh, the unabridged. Yes, I read the unabridged English version. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, it was, it was a hefty tome, but it's. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a good book. The musical. Um, it makes the doorstop as well. Yeah, it makes a great doorstop <laughs> as well. Um, the musical is, I would say obviously has to cut some things out, but it's very close to the novel. You're not going to find a lot of, like, cutting around with the characters. They essentially have the same, like, backgrounds and descriptions that they do in uh, in the novel. But these these themes of, like, of redemption and unrequited love and the poor versus the rich... Um, and compassion. These are these are all things, and I, I, young revolutionaries. These are all things that are universal themes. And I think, even though it comes from a French story, I think they're all things that people can tap into, no matter where they're at. Yeah, even if you've never stolen a loaf of bread or, or been a whore, there's always something <laughs> you can buy with them. We've does. all been a whore at some point in our lives. <laughs> That's Not, a different episode. Uh, um, metaphorically speaking. I'm like, wait, what show did you see? No, I'm talking about metaphorically speaking. Okay. Um, and, the, I mean, the music is so great. So, I mean, there's there's uh, probably more hit songs from Les Mis that, you know, every few minutes you're getting another, you know, great song. There's no filler. There's no, uh, you know, transitions or other things. It's uh, Well, and this is one of those musicals that's sung through completely. Like, there's not really dialogue in between any song. It's really like an opera, which I, I respect that as well. It's set up it's set up like a contemporary opera. Yes. In that respect. Well like we said, like Jackie just said, that it's based on a novel by Victor Hugo. Um if you want to go read that uh it really, I, I will say that, like, even though we're all joking about how thick the novel is, and yes, it's a it's a hefty read, but um, it's a very moving and emotional read. I cried while reading that novel. It's Jean Valjean is essentially like a superhero when you read it. I mean, it, it mirrors our, our modern like superhero stories where you have this like poor guy who's coming from nothing and he's trying to basically like save everybody and redeem himself. Yeah, and you know, and he can I, like in the goals. book he can like scale walls in a single bound too. It, there's there's a little stuff in the book where you're like. Huh. This is Jean Valjean. He lifts ox carts with his like fingertips and and uh, jumps jumps buildings in a single bound. It it does seem very superhero esque. I mean, it's one of my goals to read, but it is a hefty book. I read a little bit of it in English in high school and in my French class in high school, but only like a couple chapters. It's it's very very long, but it's supposed to be one of the best pieces of literature that has been written. Um, and it we should start a book club. Yes! We actually have another network called Book Circle Online. We should do it on that and just 
Let's sit down and we'll read a couple chapters. We'll reconvene three months later. Yay. Three, three, three <laughs> months? <laughs> Just give you guys, I'm giving us time. Itself to be able to be done in so many wonderful concert versions. So you had the 10th anniversary concert with, you know, Cone Wilkinson again and uh, almost all of the original cast on PBS. So it's everybody has sort of been able to see mm -hmm. these wonderfully mm -hmm. iconic performances. Yeah, that uh, was the first time I great. saw it was the 10th anniversary. Um, well, saw, quotation. Um, but yeah, it's that was what they what they called it the Dreamcast is what they called it because they got all these great people back together and some, you know, Leah Salonga was in it. So if, if you're a fan of Princess Jasmine, that's <laughs> she was Princess Jasmine. I mean, voice. she was in Miss Saigon too. So like she's she was Princess Benson. Jasmine and Mulan, Mulan, and then um, but she's she's a she's a Broadway actress too. She was in Miss Saigon. Um, she's also I'm gonna plug it again on Crazy Ex Girlfriend's finale episode. Oh, nice. Nice. And she's doing Fun Home in Manila later this year. Oh, yay. Yay. There you go. She's an, she's an amazing actress and amazing singer. Is she in the touring cast of Fun Home? Is that what? No, they're doing a production in the Philippines where she's oh, a Oh, oh, okay. Centered around her. I must have missed you saying that because, uh, yeah. Um, but the, this was originally made as a French uh, musical in the French language, and it was composed by Claude Michael Schoenberg um, with the lyrics by... At Elaine Bubil and Jean-Marc Nadel, and I'm sorry if I butchered those names. Um, and it was translated into English by Herbert Kretzmeier and uh, James Fenton helped create additional material that wasn't in the original. And it opened we'll in the French at a later date. Huh? We'll work on your French at a later I date. Know. <laughs> I know, it's terrible. I, I only took two years of French in high school. It's, it didn't help out very much. To me, it's interesting because, you know, obviously the novel's French and it, the the musical started in, in France. And, it, I mean, it did well there. It just didn't go past that, I guess, initial run before they brought it to West End with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, to me, this musical has always been British. I know that sounds very weird, but I grew up listening to the original London cast. Um, so to me, like the Tenardiers are supposed to have like a Cockney accent and like all the prostitutes are supposed to have Cockney accents and Gavroche and, and Gavroche is supposed to have a Cockney accent. And so then obviously like it comes to Broadway, they don't have those accents anymore, but then we do, um, when we do the anniversary cast, um, they bring back the well, Cockney accents, but then you sprinkle, sprinkle the... Americans and Canadians and other... Well, it makes a little bit of sense because when they first originally wanted to make this into a musical, the men that, who wrote it, they made it because they saw a production of Oliver and that gave them inspiration to be, take classic literature and make it into a musical and they always thought of Gavroche as the Artful Dodger, who is very Cockney. So in my head, it still makes sense to have everyone be Cockney. Yeah, I mean, it sounds... I mean, to me, I don't know. And the, I, I don't know if it's like... To British people, they're just like, whatever. Um, but to me, there's something very beautiful about, like, when you're an American and you're hearing the musicality of the Cockney accent in those songs, it lends a different, like, flavor to it. Definitely. And it's a fun show if you haven't listened to the original French album to sort of hear how it evolved and what songs were added and what changes were made. Um, so it's worth picking up that original concept recording if you haven't. Uh, the French album is interesting to me, too, because um, there are, when you listen to some of the French songs, there, there's, some, I don't, there's some language that's more poetic than when you translate it to English. Um, so it's obviously nothing is ever going to be a direct translation, but that, um, but that little Fall of Rain song is so much more poetic in French than it is in English. And it's pretty, pretty darn like, powerful and poetic in English. But well, it's... French, French is a love language, so everything in French automatically <laughs> is more poetic than in English. Right. I mean, there. Um, it's it's interesting because the direct translation in the French song is um, she's saying she's saying like a little drop of blood and kind of like comparing it to a little fall of rain. And um, I asked my friend, one of my very good friends who lives in Paris, I was like, am I reading this translation right? It sounds like she's like directly just saying a little drop of blood. And it was like the, the way she's saying it and then comparing it to uh, comparing it to the rain that's falling down as well. Um, she was like, yeah, that's it's just there is a more poetic way of doing that. And I was like, oh, it's it's so much prettier when you think of it that way, because she's dying as the rain's coming down. Spoiler alert. That's oh. how I plan on dying as well. Uh, that's the way down. to die. It's like, it's the, 
I think it's the best death in the whole musical, but it's just me. <laughs> and there are a lot of deaths in this musical. Well, yeah, it's the French re- beginning of the French Revolution, to start. Yeah, so there are, there are a lot of deaths. <laughs> a lot of deaths. Spoiler. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, the original show opened in London in 1985, and it's... a the longest running musical in London, I believe, on the, in West, the West End. End yeah. um, it's still playing there. It's still the original production, the original orchestrations. Which so is, like, which is yeah. different from the Broadway version I heard. Like, it's slightly, there's like two more songs in the London version and like a little bit different setup on the stage and wise and stuff like that. Yes, it's still the original staging with the turntables and stuff that are not in the current Broadway production. Um, the turntable was in the original Broadway production, I believe, but I don't. So the version that's on Broadway now. No, yeah, they took it. Brought it back to Broadway. And it's okay. Scaled down in some way, and some of the orchestrations have been changed. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit different. Okay. The tour does not have the turntables. I can confirm that because <laughs> that's the cast that I saw. Really? When yeah. I saw it on tour in San Francisco, it did have the turntable, I believe. See, I, I saw remember it turning the barricade. I saw it on tour here in a. Huh. No. Maybe it just also depends on the theater you're yeah, in. Yeah, I guess it does and depend it on the theater, if it can accommodate a turntable. It depends on which tour, because it's been yeah, touring true. for yeah, 20 true. years. So, and now it's it's the new tour that doesn't have the turntable, but it has some beautiful uh, backdrops that they project, which I think are, are based on Victor Hugo artwork. Yeah, um, yeah. They, so the, it's a different but still great experience. Yeah, the projections, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into that a little more later, but it's it, it kind of adds a certain thing to the play. It also can be a little distracting in my opinion i like it though because i think for me i because i saw i saw the the touring production with the no turntables and the and the projections and for me um they use the projections in the in the 25th you use not the same projections i should confirm they use projections in the 25th anniversary um cast and i think it helps fill in blanks in the storyline or helps fill in things where when you have a stage production and you can't keep moving in large set pieces in and out it helps i think it helps the audience kind of like figure out a place or um fill in a fill in a backstory where a lot of these characters in the books have these very like thick and um rich backstories which I, i'm not sure if if you just saw this musical once you might pick up on them or mm-hmm. not um, it's, it's done in a way, the projections, like, it, they're not extremely noticeable. It's just sometimes, depending on where you're sitting, light can reflect off something into my eye, and that's what I mean by distracting. <laughs> but that happens in other musicals, too. I just, uh, I actually just saw Cabaret last night, and they have a disco ball that kept hitting me in the eye with light. Oh, so Cabaret is a disco ball now. I shall see this next week. Yes. It has a disco ball in a, uh... In a love, I'll, I'll just say that, in, in one of the love scenes, they bring a disco ball down. Um, but anyway, the, the play is just, it's one of, I'm a huge fan of dark musicals, and this is what I would call one of the epitomes of like a dark musical, because there's very little humor throughout the entire thing. The Tenardiers are pretty much the only humor. And the best part about their humor is it is like a Sweeney Todd kind of humor where it's a very dark kind of humor. They're like laughing as they like pickpockets of the dead. So, um, and they're laughing as they like scam people in, in their, in their inn. Um, so while you're laughing with them, then when you're done, you're like, oh, but that's kind of creepy. <laughs> they're also There's just... fortunately people like that in the world. So yeah. it's... <laughs> it's relatable. And it's definitely disturbing. They and that scene when they have when they have Cosette when um, when you have Jean Valjean come to get co- come to collect Cosette after Fantine has died, um, and and they're basically like, oh, well, she's been so sick, and we've had to pay all these bills, and it's like you know they're just she's just like the the person who like sweeps the trash and everything, so so you're like these people have been treating her like garbage, and they're trying what they can to like milk more money out of him. The epitome of, of the Tenardiers to me is that Gavroche and Eponine are their children. Um, and they just, especially towards the end of the play, don't seem to care at all what happens. Like, in the beginning, they do, like, have you know this what's fondness funny for Eponine. Like, I don't think, unless you have, like, read the novel or read the background, you would understand that Gavroche is their Yeah, kid. they don't explain it very much in the actual production or in the movie, for that matter. Um, but Gavroche is 
they they try. I think he's like an or, bit, he's but. like orphaned himself basically because yeah. they they their kids have become like street rats because they're well, terrible. Well, maybe you parents. can elaborate this. I don't know if in the novel it shows it because in the beginning when you first meet them, they have Eponine dressed in all these nice clothes. They talk about how sweet she is. They seem to actually have yeah. a great fondness for her. But when we meet them again later on, as she's grown up, they seem to not have that anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's all, like, for them, it's all, Eponine is part of the scam when she's younger, so it, it's helpful to have her dressed up all, like, cute and sweet and everything so that she can be part of their running scam. When she runs out of, like, past an age where they can use her for their scam and she's no longer useful, it's like she's out on the street just like Gavroche is out on the street. And she grows as a character, so she doesn't want to be involved in their scams any longer. She that's true as well. Yeah, that's true that's as well. What? It's one of the best parts to me in the play is when she has that scuffle with her father because she's in love with Marius and she can't have the cops be coming here because it's going to destroy what he wants. She, the, the other thing I like about Les Mis is it has some just phenomenally, wonderfully strong female characters. And um, for musicals, sometimes I feel like the female characters get to be very one-dimensional. And Eponine, to me, is like one of the most fascinating characters because everything she does as an adult comes from a place of like wanting to help someone or comes from a place of love and she never really gets anything in the end other than the comfort of dying in Marius's arms who who doesn't really love her anyway you know so there's something very beautiful in this character that everything she does is for everyone else and usually they pick an actress who or uh, an actress who can sing so well so you're moved to that extra extra length to be um sympathetic towards her um but i i just i just love that this character has no real ulterior motives not i mean other than loving marius and it's just to have her parents be such a selfish beings and to have her kind of lose all of that and be opposite and just be giving everything for someone who's never going to return any feelings towards her it's just like mm. i think so many people can connect with having that love for someone even if it's everybody's had unrequited love yeah. if you haven't you're just lying you know <laughs> like I, I just i feel like if you if you're if you haven't and you know you you reach a certain age you're just lying so um I think everybody can relate to that character. And the thing is, instead of when she realizes that Marius is in love with Cosette, instead of, um, you know, sabotaging them, she helps them. Mm -hmm. Which, to me, it's like, you have such such a beautiful character. Instead of, like, what, what most um, contemporary media shows us is, like, females being like, oh, well, she's with my man, I'm going to fight her, whatever. You know? Um, and instead of having, like, a cat fight, um, you have this character who's like... Oh, I love him so much that I just want him to be happy. Um, and there's something very beautiful about that. It's the truest form of love and because you don't care about yourself anymore. Yeah, and it's the same kind of love Jean Valjean... I mean, not the same kind, but, like, you know, it's that same level of love Jean Valjean has for Cosette, which is, like, he does basically once he makes a pact with himself to take care of Cosette, everything after that point is done for the safety of Cosette. Um, and he basically, like, dies protecting the safety of Cosette, which is, like, also so beautiful to me. It was really funny. My boyfriend got so mad at Jean Valjean's character, though, and this is kind of a little off topic, but because in the beginning, you know, he stole a loaf of bread to feed his sister and her kids, and, like, they were starving, and he's like, why doesn't he ever go try to find her, his sister when he gets out of prison? Does he just not care about her anymore? <laughs> I think it's like he can't find anybody anymore because he doesn't have a cell phone. You know, it's like, this isn't like, this is there's like... No what? There's no Facebook. Yeah, yeah, there's no Facebook. There's no, you can't, I he's been on was, the chain gang for years. I just How's he going to so, find these people? I thought it was so funny that we have this story developing and this guy who's not able to get a job and is starving in the streets once again after being let out of prison 18 years later for stealing bread and breaking a window and that's what he clings on to <laughs> steve's like why didn't you find your family they're probably all dead i was like that's what i said i was like maybe they died or moved they probably away. all died of starvation because their <laughs> one breadwinner or bread stealer as it were is like in the chain gang now so that's what happened steve let's get your boyfriend on the phone to explain this to him right um but Jean Valjean, in his essence, is like 
the nicest person. And, like, whenever stuff happens in his life that is even a little bit wrong, like with Fontaine, like with her getting fired, it's, like, beyond his knowledge. And as soon as he finds out about it, he takes care of her kid to, like, rectify it. And it's just such an interesting combination to have him paired with this police officer, well, basically police officer, Mm -hmm. um, who's everything in the world to him is just black and white. It's so interesting to me, though, because I feel like, again, this is a point where Les Mis reflects modern society, where we have people who kind of uh, live outside of the contempt of the um, live outside of the constraints of the specific black and white rules of society. And you still you can still see them as good people and still see them as working for the greater good or working for what's right. And then people like Javert, Javert grew up in the same manner as um, in the same manner as Jean Valjean, which is like something we learn in the confrontation. Um, and so he's basically saying like, I could have made the same choice as you, but like I, I have contempt for people like you who don't like abide by the law. So in his mind, like, the, he set up these rules for him to kind of um, make him cope with his place in society, whereas um, Jean Valjean had someone like the bishop to show him a different way of coping with like how, of coping with this type of society. Well, it also just it's the same thing of like that line, like you know we have laws like you're not supposed to steal, you're not supposed to this, like so should that really be punished to the extent because you broke a law as a much more severe crime? And that's kind of the, the where it is. Like, where is the line crossed? Because in Javert's mind, there is no line. You broke the law. Yeah, well, that's... I mean, we have so many people out there today who believe the exact same thing. Yeah. You are a lawbreaker. It doesn't matter what the law is. It doesn't matter the reason you broke the law. You are a lawbreaker, and therefore, I will find you, and I will hunt you down for justice. That the, There are people like that who still exist today and are, like, very vocal in society versus, like, when you look at the nuances of certain situations, um, and when we talk today about things like decriminalizing marijuana or something like that, where you have people doing kind of these, like, nonviolent crimes and then going to jail for tons of years and being, like, penalized for the rest of their lives, we're asking, is this truly just? Is this really justice? Because in... in- these people's mind and in the play like Valjean you know and we tend to go to his side but in his mind he's doing what he needs to do he's doing something that's right and just but in Javert's mind what he's doing is right and just so when you have two people that both believe what they're doing is right and oppose what each other think it just creates this like really interesting dynamic because to play Javert you'd have to somehow make it in your mind also like what I'm doing is justified Hunting this man down over these years is justified. Speaking of which, I think, to me, Norm Lewis does that the best. Like, Norm Lewis is, like, the ultimate Javert to me. Like, I I saw him in the 25th anniversary um, because for the longest time I was, like, struggling with the Javert character because you want to see him when you're watching and you're like, this guy sucks. He's, like, a villain and he's chasing down awesome Jean Valjean. What's his problem? And then I think, for me, Norm Lewis plays it more along those lines where, where you're, like, you're, like, yeah, like, this guy, you can kind of see where he's coming from, you know? Like, it might not be what I think is right, but, like, I can definitely see where he's coming from. He makes you want to understand his side as well. Yeah, he plays it in such, like, in such, like, a dignified, um, non-villainous, but, like, this is my truth, this is my justice kind of way, that that was the moment where I was like, this is the guy who I think is, like, to me, epitomes Javert. Well, from the actor's mind or the character's mind, he's obviously not a villain. He is pursuing of justice. Yeah. what's right. So of course. Through his own eyes. Um, you know, he's, he's in the right, he thinks. Do you, do you have a favorite Javert? Uh, Norm Lewis is great. I saw him do it at the Muni uh, and at the, the concerts. Um, I love Philip Quast, who did the 10th anniversary, and uh, of course Terrence Mann, who did it on Broadway in the original cast, and then came back. It's, it's amazing as well. Yeah, Terrence Mann does, uh, he is, Norm Lewis I love too, but Ter- Terrence Mann, because that's what I grew up with, he's always Javert to me in my head. It's it's funny um, because I'm... Very well at the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> he's a great uh, Javert. See, I'm that, I'm that person that... Um, I like my I like to start to identify with my villains, and for me, um, 
Terrence Mann and Philip Quast were very villainy to me. A little like, for my taste, they were too villainy. Whereas like Norm Lewis is someone who I'm like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get you. It's a strong baritone voice sounds really villainy. So that's yeah. It's to their vocal credit. Yes, that's true. Um, we got to start moving along because we're going to be running out of time here pretty soon. Um, and I have some videos. So unfortunately, Robert, we're going to have to say goodbye to you right now because we're going to have to pull the videos up over where your face would be at the moment. <laughs> Um, thank you thank so much you so for, much for joining us. us. Is there anywhere people can reach you or find you on social media? On Rob Twitter, Di Instagram? W. Robert Diamond, sorry, that cut off a little bit at the end. Sure, it's Rob Diamond, BWW. BWW, Rob. great. And uh, you also have a blog out, right? Yes, if you go to Rob I World, you can click gently on my face on the right side of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, is your blog theater stuff or is it other things as well? No, it's, uh, it's theater stuff. It's about what's going on with the website, what I've seen, analysis of industry things like the Broadway Grisses and stuff. Uh, awesome. Yeah. That sounds great. You guys will have to check it out. Perfect. Yes, thank you so much for having me today, and I'll talk to you again soon. Yes, right, thank so you. Much, Bye. Bye. All right, guys, like I said. I want to really quickly, though, apologize to, like, the people who are in the live chat. I tried to do the live chat. I got a new iPhone, and now I'm, like, it's being wonky. So I, I, I am in the live chat, but I apologize because I haven't been able to keep a, a great eye on it. We do, we have some people in there, and thank you for joining us. Um, uh, we, we have people saying I love Dan Hathaway in Les Mis movie production. Sam Barks nailed Eponine as well, and we will get into the movie uh, two weeks in two now. weeks from now, which we'll go over later. But uh, yeah, Samantha Barks did a great job. She Phenomenal. was in the twenty fifth anniversary cast. Yeah. Um, before she went and did the movie. Um, and also, Joshua Ragland says, so excited to be hearing Les Mis news. Oh, yay. Thank you guys for joining and us. And you guys, please, um, we're also on iTunes as a podcast as well. Um, I would love it if you guys could go on iTunes, like, rate us, comment. Um, we'll give you a shout out here. If SoundCloud. You, yeah. I think we're on Google Play now. I, I know After Buzz is on Google Play. I'm not sure if Popcorn Talk is yet, but we will be very soon. So you can find us on many, many platforms. Yes. And if you give us a comment on iTunes, I will give you guys a shout out. <laughs> um, and please feel free to obviously like comment on the video as well if that's how you watch it. Um, also, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but the reason we chose to do Les Mis today is it is my dad's birthday, and this is his favorite show. So happy Aww, birthday, Dad! This is your tribute to video to you. Dad. Uh, <laughs> so, I like I said, I wanted to show a couple videos. Um, they, these are mostly with the anniversary casts. Um, in the 10th anniversary cast, this was the first time, like I said, I had ever seen this production done. And this little girl that plays Young Cosette, I have to play this clip just because she's, she is amazing to me. So if we go ahead and start playing it, you'll see that during this, something loud in the background crashes and she moves, but her voice does not. She just keeps... Jonathan, I think it actually played over it. Can we rewind it a little bit? Is it possible? Right there. Sorry, I just have to play that because it amazes me every time of someone of that age to not let something like that disrupt not, them Yeah, not let it disrupt her. She's a cute little Brit. Yeah, she's really cute. She's got her cute little <laughs> British castle on the cloud. Um, that was just for me because I love that little clip so much. But um, this version, you know, we had Cole Munkelson come back. We had a lot of the original cast come back. Mm -hmm. uh, Jenny Galloway... Leah Salonga, this was the one where she played Eponine, Judy. Cohen. She actually played Fontaine in one of the touring yeah, she, casts, and I like her better as, as Fontaine. As Fontaine. I don't she, know what it she is. She played in the t 2006 cast. She took over the role of Fontaine, and then she was in the 25th anniversary as Fontaine. Mm -hmm. uh, in this 10th anniversary, in all the concerts, they try to do a little something. In this one, they got all the Jean Valjeans together. Um, which was seven, well, not all of them, but 17 different Jean Valjeans from different countries to sing. Um, uh, was it One Day More? No, I can't it wasn't remember. One Day More. It was, it, it, I honestly can't remember which song they sang. It was Do You Hear the People Sing? Oh, I Do You Hear yeah. the People Sing? Do You Hear the People Sing in all their different languages, which was really cool. And I just want to show a little bit of it. Um, you guys can go get this on DVD. They have the 10th anniversary vision. I believe they have the 25th as yes, well on DVD do. that you can yeah. buy. Um, so of course, starts off with calm. <sighs> Peace on my heart. 
music of a people That's the British. who will not be slaves again. It's like the Tony Award Olympics to me right here. Yeah, it is. Just all the different it languages. Is. There is a life about to start when tomorrow comes. À la volonté du peuple et à la santé du progrès. Das ist die Symphonie von Menschen, die nicht länger Sklaven sind. It's so amazing that with the music that they can sing in their different languages and it still works with the music. Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, obviously, like, it's, I don't speak all these languages. I only understand, you know, like, conversational French and uh, English. Um, but even going from the French to the English, you can see where they've had to make certain, like, changes and concessions. And the meaning of the song is always there. It's just that, you know, you're changing the words. Something that's so fascinating about this to me that always gives me chills is that here, again, like I've said before, you have a musical that's about the French Revolution, but the themes in it are so universal that this musical can touch people in all these countries. And, and you know, as, as we've said before, that, like, the music is wonderful as well, but it's like, just because the music is good doesn't mean that somebody's going to come see a musical. They're going to come see the musical because they're not only enjoying the music, but they're touched by the story. Yeah, I mean, there's... There's definitely musicals you go see just for the music. Uh, Rock of Ages is one that I just go see for the music. I um, actually like the story in Rock of Ages, but like Cats, I don't know if I could go see Cats. Like that's to me, I love the music in Cats, but I'm still confused as to how it's like a musical. But, but the point is that you go see some for music. You you go to the musicals you love because they make you feel something. Right. And that is done through the acting, through the music, through the overall emotion of the show. And this show is just so powerful in all of the music and just hearing that song makes you want to go and just fight for something like you're like i need to go on a soapbox and just start speaking out and telling people and we need to start going forward and that's every time i hear that song that's what i feel like doing and it's to have something make you feel those certain emotions like just through music alone no matter what language you're hearing it in is pretty remarkable and i think that i mean lame is um is by no means as diverse as Hamilton, um, which Hamilton, to its credit, brought like this huge range of diversity to musicals, which is amazing. But Les Mis is also, because the themes are so universal, it's like, I, I think this is one of the things that bothered me about the movie, is that you can really, like, you cast people of any, like, race, whatever, no matter what, in these roles, and the message is there. So... It, that's we'll talk about it when we talk about the movie but that's one of the things that bothered me about the movie because I'm like you have these people like Leia Salonga who can like sing beautifully and they're not in the movie and it's like as much as I like Anne Hathaway I was like ah, why you like know I said, we're gonna get into the movie next week so we won't talk too too much about it this week but um the last clip I have is and I, I know you shared this on our page as well this is the 25th anniversary um and they got the quartet of Jean Valjean's this is beautiful. From I mean, West End and um, and Broadway together, and this is the end of the of the song. But to me, it's the best part of the song because they all hit this last note, and their vibratos match each other, which is the most amazing thing I've ever heard, and it gives me chills every time I watch it. And this is Bring Him Home. This yeah. is Bring Him Home. This is the part right here. It's just crazy. But yeah, it's crazy. Um, you know what's interesting is when I when I posted that on our page, I was reading just the top comments. And at the time, the top comment, um, because everybody, no matter what you watch, they're going to have their favorite cast member. Um, 
And Alfie Bo, uh, they get, yeah, is a very popular choice for people. Colm obviously is a popular choice because uh, he was in the original cast. Hugh Jackman is popular because he was in the movie. Um, but you don't one, hear about the other ones. Yeah, you don't hear about the other ones as much. But one of the people that was commenting on because Alfie Bo actually has, uh, like to me. As far as like vocal training, it, his voice sounds like more vocally on point than Colm's. Um, he has a very like he he manages to like hit everything perfectly. You'll never see Alfie Bo make an error. Um, but then the guy was like, "Yeah, Alfie Bo can like sing these beautiful notes and everything." But Colm under like Understood. Colm is the role. Like I mean, he's played the role so many times. Yeah. There's no way he he doesn't know that role inside and out. Like he's partially. He is, like, yeah, he's, like... Like, a part of him is Jean Valjean, yeah. no, even in his everyday life. Right. And so it's, like, the the comment was... I, I, I just found that comment so interesting because I was like, ah, that's what I've been touching on because I'm like, I sh- feel like I should like Alf- Alfie Bo equally to Colm, but I just don't. And I was like, that's why. I mean, I still because... like him. It's just, you oh, know... Yeah. I mean, I've never seen him perform the role, so I can't have a full opinion on it, but, like, Colm, when watching the 10th anniversary special with him, like, it's just gives you this overwhelming feeling of he, this is who he is like i don't even see him as calm when he's in that role yeah he is jean valjean he is jean valjean and um it's interesting because i've watched you know the 10th anniversary and the 25th anniversary and um there's just something to me about Colm that is jean valjean and that's what this commenter was trying to say is like it's just like he yeah, just he understands is. that role um and alfie was in the 2000 he was in one of the broadway 14? revivals and i i believe 2014 you know yeah. they're no they're, maybe he was just in the 25th um, he was in i had a note i have here. it in my notes too it's just right like, um i know he was in like one of the maybe he wasn't maybe he was in the west end production i don't have him in the at least in the original casts of the broadway productions but you know he does do a really great job and i've seen like clips of him singing and he does do a good job but um, we're getting down onto the wire here. Uh, so I want to go over the Tony Awards really fast because it, it was kind of weird to me. Because in 1987, we had 12 Tony Award nominations. And we had uh, eight wins. It won for Best Musical. It won for Best Book. It won for Best Score. Uh, Michael McGuire won for Featured Actor. Uh, Francis Raffel won for Featured Actress, Best Direction, Best Scenic Design, and Best Lighting, all won. So it was, that was huge, especially for the 80s. Like, that was, I think, one of the top nominated and winning musicals during that time period. Um, 2006 wasn't nominated for anything. And that was surprising to me because that's when they brought the projection in. So I thought it would at least get, like, some Should lighting. Should have been. Norm Lewis was in that cast. <laughs> <laughs> just bitter. <laughs> um, and then 2014, it was nominated for Best Revival, Best Performance by a leading actor for Raman Karmalu, and Best Sound Design, but won none. He's great, by the way, Raman Karmalu. Yeah, he was he's, in the 25th. Yeah, he's he's played several roles, um, whether on West End and Broadway. Um, he's played Jean Valjean. He played Angel Ra in the um, 25th anniversary, and he's played Marius. Yeah, and... It just, it's so astounding to me, though, that it hasn't won anything since its original thing, considering how long it's been on Broadway. Like, I mean, when 2006 revived it, it had only been off Broadway for three years. I think, though, also Broadway, or the Tony Awards is just trying to be like, hey, we can't let, you know, like, one musical dominate everything. It's clearly, like, popular with audiences, but um, they probably want to give something new a try, (laughs) you know? know, That's my um, take on that. I had two videos, but I think considering the amount of time we have, um, we're going to skip those. for the. You can watch them on YouTube, any Tony Award video you can watch on YouTube. Um, so let's get into our diva song, because we didn't go over that yet. What This is our segment, um, which we talk about what song do we just rock out to? Do we? And it doesn't have to be rock out in the traditional way. It could be a melody song that you rock out to, but it's just a song that you love so much that when you hear it, you sing it. On my own, on my own is hands down. Like I'm that I'm that girl because like this musical has either like either you take I Dream to Dream or you take On My Own. I I don't know. Maybe some people are young enough to take Castle in a Cloud, but that's like <laughs> it's a very young voice. Um, but I feel like those are the two big female songs in this one. And On My Own, like 
I, I am that fangirl. I will admit. I will admit. I, love I was I was on my own in high school, and now I'm I dreamed a dream. Um, from the theater production, I actually have a different one from the movie production. But that's like a more of a personal choice, and I'll tell that why next. See, week. I'm on my own, and then like my second song is "Little Fall of Rain" because I just I just love that moment. Like I can't help it. Whenever I, no matter what cast, no matter who's singing it, I always cry. I mean, to that she sacrificed herself for for Marius for the French Revolution, um, and I think that that moment of instead of even in her death being hateful she's just i you know i'm just happy to be in your arms um and then i want to go over which theater production which i'm already going to kind of feel like i know what you're going to say so which theater production do you prefer over the rest i don't prefer any one theater production i have like my own dream cast which obviously would have like colm and norm lewis and um i haven't picked which eponine and the angelra it would either be like you know what i would probably have raman carmelo as marius and then have Aaron Tivet as Angela. Steal him from the movie. Yes. I mean, he steal is Aaron Tivet. Yeah, he is Aaron Tivet. Um, see, I grew up with the original London production originally listening to that. So I feel like that's kind of the one I go to more than other to listen I like that to. Eponine, who they brought to Broadway. I forget what was her name again. Um, Frances Ruffell. Mm-hmm. She's the one that won on Broadway. Yeah. Um, but... She has a very distinctive for, voice too that I that I love. She has a very distinctive voice. For scenic um, design wise and stuff, I would go with the 2006 production just because I think um, with the turntable and the projection, it works really well. So I think the instance for me where that projection helps really well is Javert's story, where it's like you you have him committing suicide, you have him singing the song "Stars." I mean, not not that any of the Javerts have bad voices, but it's like it does help that kind of like scenery going on in such a, in a musical there's, yeah, where there's a lot you, of scenery and movement it helps you you not get stuck in the fact that someone's falling while standing on stage. right um so yeah guys that's our show sorry we had to kind of rush it there at the end uh but you know we always love talking theater with you guys and you know next week we will not be here at our normal time i won't be here at all jackie's gonna have something special for you so yes jackie, you i will it? i will have an interview um Scott Schofield, I'm pretty sure his name is. Um, he's a transgender activist, and he is uh, has a heavy background in theater. So tune in for that next week. It'll be at 7 p.m. because I'm actually going to see Cabaret right before. Um, and where can they find you, Jackie? 123 Jackie B on all platforms and on Snapchat, Jackie B 123 um, And, guys, you can find me, BFIPS14, Twitter, Instagram, BFIPS1214 on Snapchat. Um, quick two things. One, I just saw Cabaret, like I said earlier. It's here for two more weeks. If you're able to get tickets, go see it. It was amazing. Um, and also for the person that uh, was on our live role last week and asked about uh, Xander Doof, it was going on tour. It is going to be doing a tour, I believe, starting in the fall is what I heard, in La Jolla, California. So it is happening. All right, guys, tune in next week. Not next week, two weeks. Turn next two week weeks. for her interview. Tune in two next week for me for my interview. For and then our two movie weeks discussion for of our Les movie discussion of Les Mis. Have a great week, guys. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.